Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. He's been accused of being soft on crime. Now there are questions about his office's relationship with a criminal reform group out of Austin. Tonight, Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez is responding to criticism against his office. I think the biggest misconception has to do with me, people's perception, and I'll tell you, part of it has, has been the disinformation out of the community has been per perpetuated by the, the Officers Association and by other members in the community that I'm soft on crime because uh, I have uh, brought criminal justice reform to Bear County. The district attorney joined us tonight on the News at 6. We asked about his office's relationship with a group called the Wren Collective and accusations of bias brought by the San Antonio Police Officers Association and its president, Danny Diaz. So tonight, after that interview, Diaz is telling the night team's Patty Santos that he believes the DA should be removed from office. Think about it. If that's what this is, we have a rogue DA because his department can't make the decisions and he's allowing this organization or whatever the name of the group is to uh, to have input on that. A San Antonio Police Officers Association President Danny Diaz not holding back, calling the influence of an outside criminal justice reform group over the Bear County District Attorney's Office unethical. The story was first reported on KSAT Tuesday at 6 p.m. The citizens of Bear County and the city of San Antonio should be very upset that this is even happening. Uh, and here again, it goes back to fairness. The police union has been critical of the district attorney's office over the release of repeat offenders, charges against officers, and a bias against SAPD in two recent mistrials. On Tuesday's KSAC Q&A, Joe Gonzalez addressed some of those concerns. There's no bias against San Antonio police officers from what you have been able to find. I don't want to put those words in your mouth. Do you? Absolutely not. Quite the opposite. He mentioned something about uh, uh, due process. That's exactly what this is. It gave him the due process to then uh, come back to find another day. So a, di a denial of due process would have been my, my prosecutor sitting on this evidence and failing to disclose it and going forward with trial, which would have which could have potentially ended up in a conviction. Gonzalez says the friction began when his office created a civil rights division and a misconception created by the police union that he's soft on crime. It, it's politics. It's, it's they're, they're playing politics because they want me out of the office because they don't like having the civil rights division. They don't like uh, members of their um, departments to be held accountable. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. So the DA's interview also comes as we learned of his office's work with a group known as the Wren Collective. It's an Austin-based criminal justice reform group whose website promises, quote, strategic advising for social change, end quote. A news tip led KSAT to file a public records request for emails and text messages between the DA's office and the Wren Collective. We received more than 200 pages of texts dating back to January 21st of 2019. Okay, so that's just three weeks after Gonzalez took office. Most of the conversations are between first assistant district attorney Christian Henriksen and the Rent Collective's founder, Jessica Brandt. Now, Gonzalez himself, he was part of several pages of text. Their discussions include references to policy like bail reform and plea guidelines. Now, when we asked the Rent Collective for an interview, we, did, we asked them for an interview, but we have not yet heard back. Well, the Rent Collective was founded by a lady that uh, I have known since uh, I first ran for, for office. Uh, uh, she heard about uh, what caused me to run for office and, uh, and uh, offered her support during the campaign. Uh, so her, her involvement uh, with me during uh, the early years of the campaign and even uh, currently in the DA's office as is a support for messaging. Um, we, we didn't hire her. We haven't exchanged any monies or anything like that. Now, several texts also refer to specific cases going through the DA's office, such as that of Eric Contu, the 17-year-old who was shot by a San Antonio police officer outside of McDonald's. So we asked Gonzalez whether the Wren Collective is helping to prosecute cases or decide next steps. Nobody makes those decisions. I myself make the, those decisions. I'm the one with the name on my door, uh, and, and nobody outside the office has had any influence or input in decisions on prosecution. One of the DA's texts specifically asked that emails from the Wren Collective be sent to his personal email 
rather than his work email. KSAT filed a public records request for those emails today. For a deeper look at the text conversations and the emails between the Wren Collective and the DA's office, the story already available on KSAT.com. In other news now, San Antonio police are looking for the driver in a deadly hit and run crash. Police say that a man was hit while crossing Highway 90 near Loop 410 at around 8.30 tonight. Officers at the scene say the suspect did not stop. They do believe that person may have been driving a white pickup truck. The victim, by the way, hasn't yet been identified. The Texas Supreme Court is pausing depositions for the whistleblower case against Attorney General Ken Paxton. Those depositions, by the way, set to start Thursday, but instead, both parties are going to have until February 29th to respond with broader legal arguments for both of their sides. A few weeks ago, a Texas District Court judge ordered Paxton and three top aides to sit for those depositions. Paxton's team asked for the motion to be put on hold, and their request was granted just a few hours ago. But back to the pause. The timing of this is pretty significant because earlier today, Paxton's number one ally, former President Donald Trump, called on the court to end the case. To medical news now, coronavirus still being felt here in Bear County. In fact, we're seeing one of the largest increases in several months. Tonight, the county reporting 2,335 new COVID-19 cases here at home. For a comparison, it's a little under 1,000 more new cases than were reported last week. The good news there are still no new coronavirus related deaths to report. OK, now I want you to take a really good look at your screen here. Have a question. Have you seen that girl? That's 14 year old Scarlett Smith. She could be in danger. The Gonzalez County Sheriff's Office is looking for her along with a man that they've named as a suspect, 22 year old Barry Van Mersbergen. Now, officers say that he may go by the name Ben. They were last seen at around 11 o'clock last night in Gonzales, which is right in between San Antonio and Houston. The suspect was last seen driving a tan 2012 GMC Terrain with the Texas license plate number 3RVWG. If you know anything that can help officers find those two, you can call the Gonzales County Sheriff's Office, and that number is at the bottom of your screen there in the red. It's 830-672-6524. I want to give you an update on this year's Martin Luther King March. City officials saying that march will not be rescheduled for this year. The march canceled back on January 15th because of freezing temperatures. The San Antonio MLK March considered to be one of, if not the largest in the nation. Dwayne Robinson, the chair for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, says, quote, we will keep our community and partners informed about future opportunities to come together and do so, end quote. A multi-million dollar state-of-the-art police substation slated to go up on the south side. But before it does, the city of San Antonio asking for community feedback. Tonight, the second meeting for the 2022 bond-funded substation set to go up on South Flores. Community members in that area have expressed a need for an increased police presence to handle crime and homelessness. The city continues to grow and the south side traditionally has been neglected. It hasn't been focused on. Give your input. If your expectation is to go in there and to talk to a detective, you need to let us know that. If your expectation is to go in there and to get a report, you need to let us know. The District 3 City Councilwoman Phyllis Villagran exp explains there's still a lot to be determined before a plan is finalized and ask more residents to attend future meetings. The date for the next meeting is still to be determined. We'll keep you posted. A Central Texas Dairy Queen, now the center of a drug bust. Ten people arrested in what Clifton police are calling Operation Blizzard. Police say that several people were selling methamphetamine out of that Dairy Queen in Clifton, which is just a little west of Waco. Investigators say that operation began all the way back in June. They say that officers set up undercover drug buys from the eatery on several occasions, which then led police to discover that the employees and other people were also selling drugs, not only at that DQ, but also at other parts of town. So now let's go to your night beat news flash. The U.S. now hitting back after a drone attack killed three American service members. Sergeant William Jerome Rivers and Specialist Kennedy Layden Sanders and Brianna Alexandria Moffat died last weekend after a drone struck a small U.S. outpost in Jordan. Intelligence officials say that Iran-backed militants were behind that. Today, a U.S. official told ABC News that in retaliation, the U.S. is going to attack multiple targets on the facilities that enabled those very attacks. 
Now, it's unclear whether those targets are going to be inside or outside of Iran. Republicans now moving full steam ahead in their efforts to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. They accuse Mayorkas of willfully refusing to comply with immigration law at the border. Today, they made their case in the House. Meanwhile, Sec Secretary Mayorkas calls the charges baseless and inaccurate. House Speaker Mike Johnson wants to bring the impeachment vote to the House floor by next week. But here's the thing. Even if the House members pass it, it is unlikely that the Democratic majority in the Senate is going to go ahead and convict Mayorkas. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. You know, they say it's better to give than receive. This is definitely one of those instances. KSAC community wants to get everyone involved during National Blood Donor Month. Still time to help if you want to schedule your first ever donation or if this kind of thing is just regular, please visit DonateBloodToday.com to schedule your donation. Coming up, we got to talk about this. It's a financial aid delay. Students who are eagerly waiting to find out how much money they're going to get for college, they're going to have to wait longer. The reason why is coming up. Also, this is one of San Antonio's most popular areas. And tonight, community members shared what's most important to them when it comes to its future. And that's next on The Night Beat. If you've been to the pump, you know it. Gas prices are on the rise in San Antonio. According to AAA, the average price for a gallon of regular here in town, $2.85. That's a nine cent increase from where we stood just yesterday, up 13 cents from a week ago. The price of crude oil, the main ingredient in gasoline also ticking up. AAA Texas reports crude oil prices being boosted because of an unexpected decline in U.S. inventories and a sharp decline in production last week because of the major winter weather. So how do prices here stack up against the rest of the state and the country? While well, the statewide average for a gallon of gas, $2.82, while the U.S. average much higher at $3.12 a gallon. Now let's talk about colleges. Yeah, they're getting financial aid data from students late this year, and that's because last year we told you about this. The Department of Education revamped the free application for federal student aid. You know it is FAFSA. Now this month it was updated again to include inflation data. Now here's the good news, bad news. Good news, that process freed up an additional $1.8 billion in financial aid. Bad news, the new update delayed processing. Now the DOE is telling colleges not to expect information until the first half of March. Here's the problem. That's usually when students already get a decision on their aid and that may be delayed this year. It's also an issue because most schools still require students to commit to them by May 1st, so they don't have a lot of time. Let's go to the park now. Part two in a series of community driven input meetings to help share the future of one of the city's most beloved areas, Brackenridge Park. Tonight, community members were invited to hear the results of a survey in which thousands of people offered up their opinions on what's most important when it comes to maintaining the park. So the community can see and hear directly from this group. We listened. We heard your concerns. We're making changes to this evaluation criteria. Ultimate goal is to use that evaluation criteria to then prioritize projects in the park. Some of the feedback for the future of the park included removing invasive species, having free access to recreational activities, and permanent maintenance funds for Brackenridge. Now let's talk about something fun, okay? The Fiesta Flambeau Parade has its grand and honorary grand marshals. How can you not have fun looking at that guy? Michael Quintanilla and Angie Salinas were selected to lead this year's Flambeau Parade. Quintanilla, also known as Mr. Fiesta, you may not have recognized him without a big hat on. <laughs> He's a graduate of Trinity University, has a long covered fashion and pop culture for the Express News. Very fashionable, by the way. I mean, you, when you see him, you know it. Angie Salinas is going to be the honorary Grand Marshal. She's the CEO of the Southwest Texas Girl Scouts and also a retired U.S. Marine. Congratulations to both. You can yeah. buy tickets for the parade right now. This year's Fiesta starts on April 18th. And if I'm not mistaken, Flambeau Parade is the 27th of April, I believe. 
Yeah, that sounds about right. I'm saying that from memory. <laughs> so right now it's 52 degrees, and you know it's going to be a lot warmer by that by the time that comes around. But all right, let's talk about tonight. We had an awesome sunset. Yeah, it was beautiful. Nice cirrus clouds out there. Take a look at this picture sent in through our KSAT Connect feature on our weather app by Taylor McClellan. Right over Woodlawn Lake, gorgeous uh, cirrus clouds there, cotton candy skies, nice reflection in the lake as well. So what's up with the weather? What it's going to happen over the next few days? Well, first of all, we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. We've been talking about the weather continuing to be gorgeous tomorrow like it has been the last couple of days. Then I want to mention that storms are likely Friday night into Saturday morning. Now, most of those storms should clear out in time for any kind of outdoor weekend activities, but still it is going to be a bit windy over the weekend. So let's start by talking about the potential for storms on Friday night. As you can see, Friday during the day, Saturday during the day, not so much. It's really late Friday night into Saturday morning that we'll be seeing those storms. And we can start by looking at the weather setup. Fairly quiet across Texas with some cirrus clouds moving in from the west. That's why tomorrow is going to be a beautiful day because we've got this ridge of high pressure in place. High means dry, dry weather tomorrow with just a little bit of those cirrus clouds. Our next storm system is all the way out in the Pacific, and you don't need a meteorology degree to see where that is. Can you see that counterclockwise spin right over the Pacific? That's where our next rainmaker is at the moment. It's already producing some rain for areas in the Pacific Northwest and in California. You can see that low as it approaches by Thursday night is going to be bringing a lot of storminess to California, parts of Nevada, the Four Corners region even going to be seeing some snow. We will see rain from this system as early as potentially the evening commute on Friday. So plan ahead. Evening commute on Friday could potentially be just a little damp. It isn't though until the overnight hours that we'll actually see some storminess. This is look at midnight. Friday into Saturday morning. So if you're a light sleeper, your kids are light sleepers, your pets are light sleepers, Friday night you might get woken up by a few rumbles of thunder. I don't anticipate damaging severe weather, but there could even be some small non-damaging hail with some of the storms that happen overnight Friday night into Saturday. We'll keep you posted. A look at Saturday 6 o'clock. So pre-dawn, most of the storms are already east, and then during the day on Saturday it should be fairly dry. Again, that window for storms is overnight Friday into Saturday morning. How much rain could we see? Even though we've seen a lot of beneficial rain the last couple of weeks, we could use some more to help to continue to chip away at the drought. About half an inch to an inch of rain around San Antonio. Higher amounts east of San Antonio from Gonzales to Houston. Lesser amounts out west from Del Rio to Uvalde. It was a beautiful day. We got up to 71 after a morning low of 43. And tomorrow is going to be very similar. Waking up at 45 degrees, but a very quick warm up. You won't need the jacket for long. 61 by 10. 70 nearly by noon and then an afternoon high of 73 degrees in your neighborhood tomorrow. It'll be 39 in Kerrville, 46 in Del Rio, Chile, starting Catula and New Braunfels. So make the kids use the jacket at the bus stop early, but they won't need it later on in the upper 30s in the hill country tomorrow. But all of us will be getting up into the low 70s for the high. It'll be 71 in Kerrville, 73 in Converse, 73 in Seguin, 73 in New Braunfels. Another nice day on Thursday with a chilly morning comfortable afternoon. More clouds Friday, but again, the rain really starts Friday night into Saturday morning and then windy behind that system. Take a look at those wind gusts Saturday and Sunday gusts up to 35 to 40 miles per hour. But again, hopefully we'll get some happy backyard rain gauges Friday night into Saturday. And we'll continue to keep you posted. Those are always welcome. Thank you. You know, they say progress over perfection, but if mm -hmm. you're on the Lytle girls team, it's all about perfection, Mary. All about perfection. Yes, the Lytles girls basketball team remains perfect in district competition. And tonight they celebrate a couple of milestones en route to victory. The Houston Texans are winning this offseason. These two key pieces to the offensive coaching staff are coming back to finish what they started. We'll take a deeper dive right after the break. Tonight, the Lytle girls basketball team visited Dilly with a pair of Pirates on the brink of school history. Off a steal in the first half, Lytle senior Calissa Severe scores on a wide open layup for her 3,000th career point. 
A timeout was called to commemor commemorate the milestone and Severe will play in the San Antonio Sports All-Star Game March 24th, so keep an eye out for her. Teammate Katara Whitfield dropped 18 points of her own as the Pirates dominated this one 94-17, getting head coach Lori Wilson her 200th career win, a historic night for the Pirates program. It feels really good because not a lot of people can do it, but the fact that I was blessed to do it, it was really good. The last four years is when I've gotten my second hundred, so uh, I told those seniors about 15 games back how many I needed, and Calissa looked at me and she said, we got you, coach. But for it to be on the same night, it's just so special. It's like the best, best ever for our community. With the win, Lytle stays unblemished in District 28-3A play. The Pirates next face Hondo before closing out the regular season against Crystal City. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. It's the offseason for the Houston Texans, but the, today they celebrate two significant victories. Both offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick and quarterbacks coach Gerard Johnson have been hot names across NFL coaching searches. But this evening we learned Slowick and Johnson are staying in Houston to finish what they started with C.J. Stroud and head coach D'Amico Ryans. Both coaches had the opportunities to advance their careers, but they've elected to stay put with a team whose upside is sky high with rookie C.J. Stroud. It's being reported Slowick signed a one-year deal with the Texans that includes a significant raise, the same being reported for Johnson. And speaking of, Houston's stud rookie under center C.J. Stroud receives a Pro Bowl nod. Plenty for Stroud to smile about today. The former Ohio State quarterback will replace Super Bowl bound Patrick Mahomes and he becomes the 13th rookie QB in NFL history to be named a Pro Bowler. Stroud just put together a historic season where he finished with the third most passing yards by a first year quarterback. He's also a finalist for Offensive Rookie of the Year. The NFL Honors Ceremony is on February 8th. Well, Jeff Trailer adds a new weapon to his UTSA coaching staff with the hiring of Galen Scott out of the Louisiana football program where he coached linebackers for three seasons. Scott will be the Roadrunners defensive pass game coordinator and linebackers coach. Scott brings a decorated coaching resume to UTSA. He was also an accomplished linebacker himself back in the day at Illinois State. Well, some big news to come out of the UFL. The San Antonio Brahmas signed kicker Donald De La Haye, also known as Destroying. Donald is a YouTube sensation with over five and a half million subscribers. So it's no doubt this pickup is great exposure for the Brahmas and the UFL as a whole. In college, Donald was a kicker and receiver for Central Florida. He also played a couple of games in the CFL. Donald shared with us his emotions after signing with San Antonio. And I, I still pinch myself when I wake up in the mornings because uh, I'm so excited. I've played football for a lot of years and I've always wanted to get back to the game, never had the right opportunity. But now, thank you to the UFL and the Brahmas, I'm, I'm able to get, uh, you know, one step closer to my dreams, man. I'm super excited for the season. Awesome stuff. All right, coming up after the break, Victor Wembanyama becomes the 11th Spurs player to be chosen for the Rising Stars game. Stay with us. Rookie Victor Webinyama not only leads San Antonio, but also all NBA rookies with 20.6 points per game, 10.1 rebounds per game, and a league high average of 3.1 blocks. Wemby's stats made him an easy selection for the Rising Stars Challenge All Star Weekend. The Rising Stars Challenge is a showcase of rookie, sophomore, and G League players tournament style. The game will be played on February. Uh, 16th, a Friday in Indianapolis ahead of the All-Star Game. And hey, I'm looking forward to that first ever three-point contest between Steph Curry and Sabrina Onescu. It's such a fun weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun this year. It'd be great to see Wimby out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. We'll be right back. Chamber of Commerce weather tomorrow, 45 mm -hmm. in the morning, 73 in the afternoon, a nice day on Thursday. We'll see some clouds on Friday, but really the big story is Friday night, Saturday morning, early, there's going to be some storms in the area. We'll keep you updated about that storm chance as it gets closer and closer. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.